Thank you for joining us for this session. I'm not really sure what you expected when you saw the title, but hopefully by the end I will have met some of your expectations. Um, that's right. Okay, I'm using this because apparently they need it for the video. Otherwise, being a school teacher, I can assure you I could manage this room without a microphone, but uh, I'm trying to cooperate. So <laughs> there we are. Uh, maybe that's a good way to get started. I'm a, by training a high school mathematics teacher and I spent 15 years teaching high school mathematics. And then in the second half of my life, uh, which started about 17 years ago, I started um, getting involved in teacher training, materials development and research, all in the field of mathematics education, and have shifted more recently to a particular focus in the early grades because I'm very aware of how we lay the foundations in the early grades, which later on we either reap the harvest or suffer if we haven't done a good job. Um, I work in Jordan on a RTI, um, on a USAID funded project uh, led by RTI uh, called the Early Grade Reading and Mathematics Initiative. The Queen Rania uh, Teacher Academy is a partner with us on that project. and. Uh, it's a project where we're implementing um, uh, effective foundational um, teaching methodologies in reading and mathematics for the early grades KG to grade three. And so, uh, and, and with that project, inshallah, we're reaching all of the schools, uh, all the public schools in the kingdom, and in total, that's about 14,000 teachers. And over the life of the project, some half a million students will inshallah have been impacted on by the project. So that's a very exciting project. And today I will tell one or two stories around that. I'd, I work best by telling stories. So let's start with the stories and see where they go. And just to summarize, I am with an organization called RTI International and we, we work in a variety of different countries doing this and other work. I'm going to start by telling you a story of a grade two boy that I observed in a class about now, it's probably about 10 or 12 years ago. I happened to be sitting next to him, and he was doing something that caused me to take out my camera, and I videoed a little bit of what he did. But let's begin by just having a look at this worksheet, because the worksheet is interesting, and it's important to, in a sense, spend a minute looking at it, because it will inform how we view the video. If you have a look at this video, it's very clearly the addition of two-digit numbers, and what is also very clear from the, video, from the worksheet is that there is absolutely not a single case where the child has to bridge the 10. So in every single case, there is not a bridging of the 10. Now we can understand, if not agree, we can understand why teachers do this because the thinking is, of course, let's first get children adding without bridging so that they are confident before they hit the wall of bridging. I will argue that I think that's very damaging, but I will make that point slowly and carefully. Let's have a look at this little boy. Because it will be difficult for you to see the details, I will superimpose on the worksheet what he's doing. Watch as carefully as you can what he's doing. Here he goes. Now, different people see different things when they watch that video. I've shown the video many times, and some people complain that the boy has a very short pencil. That is a distraction or a distress to them. Some people are not happy with the way he holds his pencil. I have a very different set of concerns. Some people watch this, and they are concerned that he adds from left to right, whereas they would expect him to add from right to left. Of course, there is absolutely nothing that says you have to first add from right to left. You can, frankly, add from left to right as long as you have a mechanism for dealing with the situation where you have bridging. But I want to have a look at this in a slightly different way. 
Okay, let's pause for a moment. Why is he not writing numbers over here? Say again. Well, s sorry, where was that? The, well, there is a zero, but he's, he doesn't see a zero. Say again. Ah, he's not seeing two numbers. And he has learnt that you have to have two numbers to add them together. So if you don't have two numbers, you don't have a job to do. You've got no addition to do. So he does nothing. All right? However, if we forget for a moment about those isolated cases, I think there are 33 problems on this page. What you should notice is that this child will get 100%. All right, take away those examples. He will get every question he attempts correct. Are we together? So the only thing that his teacher knows from observing his worksheet is that he can add two-digit numbers. That is the takeaway message. Good. Let's continue with our journey. On the second side of the page, there are some subtraction problems. And this turns out to be a wonderful learning opportunity because they are subtraction problems. But he's going to add. Why is he going to add? Because children have learned very early on not to worry about the symbols. They just do what their teacher tells them. So on the first side of the worksheet, they added. So the second side of the worksheet must be more addition. So he just, it's an ad day. And at the risk of, of, of taking too long on this story, I think what we also find is that teachers break the days up into addition days and subtraction days and multiplication days and division days to avoid confusion. Because if you put them all on the same day, oh my God, that's just going to be too traumatic. So we try to break education up into tiny little parcels. And this boy has learned if it's an addition day, you add. If it's a subtraction day, you subtract. So he's going to add. But the, beaut the beauty about that is that we learn a lot about him because he does that. So let's watch what he does here. I'm afraid I don't know what he writes over here, so I can't show you that, but he'll come to the next line very quickly. And so forgive him for adding instead of subtracting, but here he goes. And you see with the same confidence that he did on the other side, he completes that problem. If you look at his fingers, he's not exactly using his fingers. His mental arithmetic with single digit numbers is fairly sound. He comes to the next problem. And he writes down the three. And then he goes back to the top problem where he realizes he's got a similar problem to the bottom problem. And he writes a one and a two. And he comes to the bottom. And now that he is full of the confidence of what he's doing, he finishes the last problem off quite quickly. What is happening here, in my mind, is that it is revealed to us that he was never adding two-digit numbers. He was adding a left-hand sum and a right-hand sum. He saw two sums, a left-hand sum and a right-hand sum, and his job was to, uh, to, to produce a number with those sums. Um, his job was to produce a number. And then I want to just draw, get distracted for a moment. And then we are surprised when many years later asked to add two thirds plus three fourths, the child will answer five sevenths. Because it's really the same thing. In the way that this child is doing a left-hand sum and a right-hand sum, this child is doing a top sum and a bottom sum. And, no, no, don't take a photograph of this. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine how traumatic that would be? <laughs> <laughs> now you can go again. <laughs> you can't have that appear in the program, my God. <laughs> what is he teaching? The serious and important point that I want to take away from this boy is just because the answer is right does not mean he's doing what we think he is doing. 
let me say that again. Just because the answer is correct does not mean that he's doing what we think he's doing. Which tells us a lot about assessment and observation and all sorts of other stuff. But I just want to really make that point here. Now, I've also shown this video to many people. And many people will say to me, well, it's just because we haven't taught him properly. By which they mean we haven't drilled him hard enough on how to do column arithmetic. And I'm arguing that we shouldn't be teaching him column arithmetic at all. We should be teaching him understanding. But I'll talk more about that. So is there something inherently wrong with children? No, there's nothing inherently wrong with children. Here's a group of grade one children that I was working with some years ago. And we're sitting in a class, and I've got some dolls on the mat, and I've got some beans under here. And I asked the children who could share the beans for me so that each child got the same number of beans. And this little girl comes forward. And she gives three beans to each child. And then another two. And finally, she gives each child one more. Sorry. Oh, come on. Don't fight with me. And eventually, she gives each child one more. And she has effectively shared 18 by 3. She's in grade 1. She's never heard the word division. She's never heard, she might not even be able to count up to 18. And there's a very good chance that if she could write the number sentence 18 divided by 3, it would have no meaning for her. But she's able to do it. Children come to school with an inordinate and uh, capacity to make sense of situations, to give meaning. And I'm going to make the thesis or the hypothesis later today that through that, they can learn to do mathematics. And that's the, th the central thesis of my remarks. I want to tell you now the story about I don't know how to do that using mathematics. This is a story that takes place in Jordan. As you see from my videos, they take place in a variety of different contexts. I have a charmed life and I work in different places. But I'm going to start telling you now a story that took place in Jordan. In fact, Sabrine, who's, who's with us today, was with me when this episode took place. We were doing some research in the RAMP initiative on how the mathematics component of that initiative is being tr in tr translated into classroom practice, how it's being implemented. And we did a very, very small bit of research where we visited six teachers in their classrooms in three schools, two in Zarka and one in Jirash. And in each school, one grade two and one grade three class was observed. So we observed a grade three class, we observed a grade two class, and in particular, we watched the grade 3 teacher and the grade 2 teacher teaching a problem-solving component. All right, that was our focus of observation. The teacher knew we were coming to observe that, and that's what we did. However, in each school, we also interviewed some children, and in particular, interviewed grade 1 children as well. And I'll reveal in a few minutes why we did that. So the story that I want to tell you now is, uh, sorry, and when we interviewed them, we had four problems and selected from these as each interview evolved. So we gave the child a first problem, and then depending how they responded, we gave them a second or a third problem. And the story that I want to tell you is about a little grade one boy. So in classroom Z1, the researcher was interviewing a grade one student. All right, it's up there, but I'm just going to tell you the story as I remember it. I gave the boy some counters. And I said to him, and, I, and some paper and some pencil, and I said, you can use these if you want to, but you don't have to. I would like you to help me to make sense of a situation. I would like you to help me to solve a problem. And I said to him, if three friends were to share 18 sweets, candies, how many sweets would each friend get? Now, we've just watched a video of a grade one child solving that problem. So we know that they can do that. And this little boy sat there for a while. He didn't touch the counters. He didn't write anything on the paper. And instead, he sat still for a very, very long time. So much so that after a while, I said to him, what are you thinking? And he paused and he said, I don't know how to solve that problem using mathematics. Now, what is interesting about that is that at no point did I tell him we were doing mathematics. I asked him to help me to solve a problem. Now, of course, it's perfectly reasonable to accept that, expect that his teacher had said, this guy is coming to visit us because he's interested in mathematics. So the child may have experienced this as a mathematics situation. Fair enough. 
But he said to me, I don't know how to do this using mathematics. I went on to encourage him not to think about it as a problem of mathematics, but to think of it as an everyday problem. So what I did was I counted out eight beans or six beans, and I said, for example, if you and I were to share these beans, how many beans would we each get? And he gave me two, and he took two for himself, and he gave me another one, and he took another one for himself, and he said, we'll each get three. I said, great. Could you, in the same way, work out how many beans each of the three children will get, or each of the candies each of the three children will get, if they share the 18 candies? And without hesitation, he counted out 18 candies, he gave three to e put three in a pile, he put another two in each pile, another one in each pile, very similar to what the child in the video did, and he said, boom, here we go, we've got a chair for you right here. Um, and, 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 and he said, poof, each of the children will get six candies. Now, what did he mean when he said, I don't know how to do that using mathematics? What did he mean when he said, I don't know how to do that using mathematics? That's really, for me, the interesting thing. Now, of course, these are young grade one children. We can't conduct cognitive interviews. We don't know for sure. So what we're left with is with speculation. But I have a sense that he was trying to follow the taught problem-solving stages. You see, in every single one of those six classrooms that we watched, the teachers were very explicit. They said to the children, today we are going to solve problems. What are the four steps of solving a problem? And she would write the four steps on the board. One, plan. Two, no, sorry, one, understand. Two, plan. Three, execute. Four, verify. And they drilled that and they practiced that. They said, right, the four steps are da, 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 da. Here's our problem. So what's step one? What's step two? And step two, the plan stage, involved converting the problem into a mathematical number sentence. That was what step two was. And when this boy says, I don't know how to do that using mathematics, I think this is what's happening. Being in grade one and near the beginning of the year, he only has two operations at his disposal, plus and minus. He knows from the situation that the answer is about five or six. But he does not know how to take 18 and three and plus or minus them together to get the answer which he knows. Are we together? And for me, there is, lies a deep tragedy because we know that the boy can make sense of the situation, but his experience, his expectation of what he's expected of him, namely to develop an equation and then to solve that equation to give this answer, is crippling him and he can no longer do anything. We have taken away from him his autonomy, we have taken away from him his, his ability to make sense by telling him how mathematics is done. And that, for me, is, 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 is a, a tragic story. It made a profound effect on me. And uh, <laughs> Sabrina and I will tell the story in Mexico in two weeks' time at an international conference there. Because this boy articulated so beautifully what I think many children experience. He says, I know how to do that. I just don't know how to do it using mathematics. I'm happy to take some comments or questions or thoughts. Don't be shy. I'd like this to become a little more interactive, but we don't have to have comments. I'm just inviting if you want to. Okay, let's carry on. I told you, I tell a lot of stories. I'm going to tell you a few more stories that make this point in a different way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about an assessment task, and I'm going to give you, so in a greater, bigger assessment task called the early grade reading, uh, sorry, early grade mathematics assessment, the so-called EGMA, we assess children. And one of the tasks is a so-called problem-solving task. That problem-solving task is there for a particular reason, and I'll clarify that later on when I've shown you what happens. In that particular problem, the focus of the word problems, or the problem-solving task, is on assessing the ability of students to make a plan and solve a problem. When we say make a plan here, we mean something very different to what the teacher means when she says make a plan. We mean make a plan. In grade one, a plan could mean using counters and working it out. A plan could mean drawing a picture. A plan could mean acting it out. 
So for that reason, we keep the numerical, the, the numerical values very small. In other words, it's not about the numbers, it's about how do the numbers fit together and how do they create a situation. The reason that numerical values are small is to allow the targeted skills to be assessed without their arithmetic getting in the way. So here we have the four problems. There are two children in a vehicle, three more children get into the vehicle. How many children are there in the vehicle? Now in the literature on problems, this is called a change result unknown problem. The number of people in the vehicle is changing and what we don't know is how many there are at the end. In the second problem, there are six children in the classroom. Two of the children are boys, the rest are girls. How many girls are there? What we call this, we call this a combined problem because boys and girls are combined to make a class. And it's a part unknown problem because we know how many children there are in the class. We know how many boys there are, we just don't know how many girls there are. Now conceptually, a combined problem is a little bit tougher than a, comp than a change problem because there are th different locuses within that problem. The third problem says, mother has eight children and she has three oranges. How many more oranges does she need so that each child will get one orange? Sorry, I must interrupt just to say that in this context, the problem is told to the child. They don't have to read the problem. The problem is told to the child. A mother has eight oranges, she has th uh, ch eight ill children. This is called a compare problem. You're comparing the number of children with the number of oranges. Oranges don't become children, children don't become oranges, and they don't get combined to make fruit salad. You've got children and oranges, and they're separate. But you're comparing which one do you have more of, and how many more. And again, it's a part unknown. And finally, another change problem. There are some mangoes in the basket. Five mangoes are added to the basket. Now there are nine. How many mangoes were there in the basket to begin with? Notice this is a change problem, and in this particular problem, the startup is unknown. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to show you some children's responses. And what I'd like you to do, here's what I'd like to do, is I'd like to go through it twice. I'm going to show them to you, and I'm going to keep quiet, and I'd like you just with a neighbor to look at this and to see what do you see happening. Then I'm going to go through it a second time, and, but I want you to see all four children's responses, and then we're going to go through it a second time, and we'll have a chat. All right? So try to discuss with your neighbor what the child is doing, and what does that response tell us about the child's experience of mathematics, or how they experience mathematics. So let's go. Here's Aluta. Aluta is in grade one, and Aluta has... Oh, by the way, they were asked to write their final response in that little square. This was working space that they could use as they wanted to. A looter is a little grade one boy. Chat to your neighbor about it. All right, another grade one boy, Tyrone. Sorry, Aluta's actually a girl. Tyrone is a boy, grade one. We go to grade three, Mitchell. Mitchell is a grade three boy. Hala, bring the chairs down the middle here, it'll be easier. And finally, James is also in grade three. James is also in grade three. Okay, let's go back. What did we notice? Aluta, grade one. What did we notice about Aluta? Yes, please. Right, right. Aluta draws pictures 
and is clearly able to make sense of the situation. In each picture, we see a bus, we see the children, we see, them, we see what's happening. There were two on the bus, three more got on. Here we see the classroom with the boys and the girls in gender-appropriate clothing. Of course, we don't know what he drew first, but we see that. In this story, it's a little bit interesting because we see the eight children. We don't see any oranges. But somehow he was able to make sense of that, and he got five. And over here we see the basket with nine mangoes. We don't know again which were drawn first and which were drawn last, but the child's able to make sense of it and say there were four mangoes in there to begin with. Are we together? So, although Aluta tries to write a number sentence here, which happens to be correct, and over here some f semblance of a number sentence which is just a nonsense, Al oh, and here, here, Aluta writes a number sentence that's actually a good representation of the situation and extracts the answer from it. All right? Getting right. Every single answer is correct. When we go to the other child in grade one, Tyrone, we see some similar stuff happening. I know there aren't five children. I think this guy got, or, or this child was drawing and got bored and said, I know now the answer. I don't need to draw any more. I've got the answer. Notice that this child makes no attempt to write number sentences. Four girls, two boys, gender appropriate clothing. Very clearly we can see the children, we can see the oranges, and we can see the allocation of oranges to children, and we can see the missing oranges. And finally, in this situation, there is a basket with the mangoes, and I'm not sure exactly which ones are crossed, or which, but there are nine mangoes, and there are ones that were there originally or not, and four is the correct answer. When we get to grade three, three years later, or two years, you know, whatever you want to count it, two years later, three years later, the first one they get right, because this is the familiar structure. I go to the, I go to the market, I buy five apples, then I buy another five, how many have I got all together? Poof. In the second problem, there are six children and two of them are boys. The child just takes the six and the two and adds them together, thinking that exactly the same approach of this will solve the problem here. A mother has eight children. Ironically, the child writes a number sentence that describes the situation, although the picture does not. A number sentence that describes the situation, but does not get the correct answer. And finally, over here, again writes a number sentence that ironically does describe the situation, but does not extract from it the correct answer. And over here we have uh, James, and James being very mature and in grade three understands mathematics to be about taking the numbers and writing an equation and producing a number. And he produces one correct number because it's impossible to get this one wrong and three incorrect answers. Why I'm so excited about maintaining the problem-solving aspect of that early grade mathematics assessment is exactly this. It allows us to demonstrate to governments that where we use the test that actually there's nothing wrong with their children. They are able to make sense of the situations. However, when the mathematics becomes more formal and is presented in a way that does not make sense, they resort to recipes without understanding and the wheels come off. Again, at any point, comments or questions, you're welcome to disagree with me. I'll explain to you why you're wrong and we'll carry on. <laughs> okay. Here's my hypothesis. Children who are taught mathematics as rules to be remembered very soon suspend any attempt at sense making. If there's one message that I want to convey today, this is the message. Children who experience mathematics as rules to be remembered very soon suspend any attempt at sense making. And yet we know that when they arrived, they could make sense. My argument is that we need to help children experience mathematics, sorry, we need to make a shift in how children experience mathematics. We need to make a shift from the memorization of facts, rules, procedures produced, uh, needed to produce an answer to a meaningful sense-making problem-solving activity. And unless we make that shift, we're not going to be able to help children have a more effective 
better, happier experience of mathematics. Now, I know that the session, some of you may not be early grade teachers, it makes no difference. The same applies throughout the grades. I started my career as a high school mathematics teacher, and the same applies at high school, and I will use some examples to illustrate that. So, what does this mean? What does it mean to help children experience mathematics as a meaningful sense-making problem-solving activity? And I argue that to do that, we need to use a problem-driven approach. Children come to school able to make sense of situations. Children come to sense a uh, school able to solve problems. Let's use that to teach them to do mathematics. And so what I want to do now is I want to focus on the role of problems. And I want to go back, this is in South Africa, to that school where I showed you the girl, little girl dividing the beans. This school is in a very rural part of South Africa, although that means nothing. By the way, I live over here, right at the southern tip of the African continent. And we are over here in Amman. When you look at a satellite photo of that school, it's a fairly rural school. It's a not a well-resourced school, and it it's comes from a very poor community. And I was in that school in the very, very first week of the school year, the first week of grade one. Now, these children have not been to KG. They have not had any prior experience. This is literally their first week of school. And I'm sitting on the mat. This is me over here. And I'm sitting with the children on the mat. And I said to them, here are two dolls. Which doll has more beans? By the way, I want to stop the video at that point and just go back for a moment. From that initial reaction, you should be able to deduce that I'm telling the truth. That is, this is the beginning of the school year. One, the uniforms are fresh and new and starched. But secondly, the children are very enthusiastic. We should be able to kill that within two weeks, but at this stage, they are incredibly enthusiastic, all right? And so here we go. Which child has the most? And every single one of them knows which child has the most. And then I said, who can help me by giving this doll a few more beans so that the two dolls have the same number of beans? And again, there is quite an enthusiasm. Children want to get involved. And I have to beat them back. And I have to say, no, we're going to get this girl to do the problem. And this girl comes to the problem and she adds beans to that pile. And in fact, when she's finished doing so, she checks her answer. She's counting each pile. <coughs> and what she has done is solved a change part unknown problem. Of course, she can't necessarily write six. Of course, she can't necessarily write plus, And she certainly can't write that number sentence. And if she could write the number sentence, it would have no meaning to her. I'm writing the number sentence there to draw our attention to what she has done. She has incredible <laughs> capabilities of making sense of situations. In the next problem, I said, who can help me by taking some beans away from this child's so doll, so the two have the same number of dolls. And this girl immediately comes up, and she picks up the three beans, and she throws them aside, as if to say, I had to wait six years to come to school for this? <laughs> Is this all you could throw at me? Really? No bigger challenge? And she has just solved the problem, how much must be taken away from five so that you're left with two. Again, she can't write that number sentence. Again, she could, if she could write it, she wouldn't know what to do with it. But she's able to make sense of it. And in the neighboring class, you've already seen this video, this little girl comes and gives three and then two. I want you to notice something about this child, though. She doesn't go one, 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 one. Children only start going one, one, one when they have been damaged by their teacher who tells them to go one, one, one. Organically, okay, if I've got three dolls and three beans, the child is going to go one, one, one. If I've got three dolls and six beans, the child might still go one, one, one. But if I've got three dolls and a huge pile of beans, the child's going to look at this and say, one, one, one is going to take me a week. Handful, 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 smaller handful, smaller handful. In other words, not only does she know how to make sense of the situation, but in fact she comes to school with a desire to be efficient. She has just solved the problem 18 divided by 3, and she certainly cannot count up to 18. 
A few years later, when she is in grade three and asked to divide 72 by four, she might draw the four children. This is South African currency, don't worry about that. She, she gives them uh, 72 divided by four. She first tries to give them each 20 because she tries to give them a big handful. She realizes she doesn't have enough to give them a big handful, so she gives them a smaller amount, halves that, halves that again. Notice that her thinking is no different to the thinking that she used when she arrived at school. The only thing is because the numbers have become bigger, she needs to have a more efficient way of writing that up. So in a problem-solving approach, the first purpose of a problem is to introduce children to mathematics. We can introduce mathematics through situations. We have a choice. The choice is to go into class and say, today we are going to do addition. Listen carefully, addition. Say it after me, addition. Not you, but, <laughs> uh-huh. Or we can go into class and say, here is a situation, make sense of it. What you have just done, we call addition. That's the choice we have. Problems introduce learners to the different situations that give meaning to the basic operations. Now, because I'm concerned that some of you don't teach grade one, two, and three, and I want to give you a, a problem to demonstrate that better, here is a problem from some materials that we use in a project in South Africa. Workers at a factory are paid 45, that the South African currency is called the rand, 45 rand per hour. Uh, uh, r there are 20 rand to the uh, JD. So these workers are paid two JD per hour, just before you thought that we were very wealthy in South Africa. You know. So they paid two JD per hour, which may still be a good rate, but that's another story, all right? Complete the table to make it easy to work out how much they must be paid for a specific number of hours. So the first part of the task is fill in the table. Now filling in the table is really just manipulating numbers. But if you were smart at this, you might go one hour is 45, another hour is 90, Double that again, double that again. Multiplying by 10 is easy. Half of 10 is 5. 9 is one less than 10. 3 is unpleasant, but you can double that to get 6. And one more is 7. Okay, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to say that if children have a confident sense of number, that table fills in very quickly. If they don't have a confident sense of number, then they're going to go 45, 90, and they're gonna, you're going to see them counting on their fingers for a day and a half. But we don't ask the children to fill in this table because we care about the table. We ask them to fill in the table because we want to ask them the question, if Tim works for 136 hours, how much will he be paid? How much will he be paid? And there isn't a child who is participating in this meaningfully who doesn't realize that he will be paid for six hours and for 30 hours, and for 100 hours. In other words, every child that has participated in this situation understands that 136 times 5 is 100 and uh, times 45, and 30 times 45, and 6 times 45. And you simply have to add the answers together. Now, stay with me. That from the context made sense. The mathematics that we are trying to teach is called the distributive property of multiplication. We had a choice. Either we go into class and say, we're going to teach the distributive property of multiplication, or we have a situation. We do that a few times. We begin to see a pattern, and we say, that's called the distributive property of multiplication. But of course, that's not how you remember learning the distributive property of multiplication or long multiplication. This is what you remember. And of course, some of you are cross with me because you would prefer the big number to be at the top and the small number to be at the bottom because that's one of the rules. And I'm saying, deal with it. Then you had to learn the steps. 6 times 5 is 30, put down a 0, remember a 3. Then you had to go 6 times 4 is 24, 
And now the rule was not write down the 4 and remember the 2. No, no, no. Now there was a new rule. Take the 24, add the 3 that you're remembering to it, get 27, and write down the whole 27. So we had three steps to produce the 270, which we then erased, because it doesn't look very nice to have all that working on the side. Better still, you do the work on a rough piece of paper. For the next line, there was another rule. This is the second line. So what do we do on the second line? Let's see if you remember the rules. Put down a zero. Well done. That's why you passed mathematics, because you remember to put down a zero. Teacher, why do we put down a zero? Because I am your teacher, and I tell you, on the second line, you put down a zero. But sir, if I may ask one more question, what is it, my child? There's also a zero on the first line. Yes, my child, that's why you struggle with mathematics. You ask too many questions. This zero is a zero. This zero is a placeholder, and we carry on. And when all is said and done, when all is said and done, we find ourselves with 270, 1,350, and 4,500. The outcome was exactly the same. This made sense. This did not. Now, I want you to take another moment on this because people say to me, but Arnout, one day children will have to learn how to do this. That is an entirely different discussion and one for which I don't really have a lot of time now. But my argument is that is true for 40 years ago. Today, if you really have to multiply 136 by 45, use a calculator. We live in a world where calculators are ubiquitous. You came into this room with four calculators. On your cell phone, you've got a basic calculator, a scientific calculator, a financial calculator, and most importantly, a loan repayment calculator. Maybe you don't know where they are, but they're there. All right? You don't have to multiply 136 by 45 anymore. And even if we're not going to agree on that, which for the moment I don't worry about too much, children in grade 2 and 3 definitely don't have to learn how to do this because the numbers that they're working with are so small that they can still learn in a way that makes sense. So, yes, please. Yes. Thank you, A, for in, in engaging, and thank you for your example. I, I, I want to suggest that we, we don't have to spend as much energy making sense of this way, because actually this way is not sensible. So what I'm saying is, what I hear in your story is you're trying hard to make sense of something that's not sensible, whereas there is actually a deeper, easier sense-making way. Sure, sure, sure. I, th I, think th I think what's important is that we have what we call age, grade, and number range appropriate strategies. And this is an appropriate strategy when the numbers get very big. Until then, I don't think it has a place. I want to use another example from our materials that we use. And this is the how we introduce the fraction concept. Because I want to demonstrate again that it is possible to introduce everything by means of situations. So in this particular story, we don't begin the day by saying, today we are going to do fractions. We begin the story today by saying, 
Today we have another problem. And in the classroom, that is the culture. Every day we solve problems. We make sense of problems. So in our problem, Fundi and Yusuf want to share three chocolate bars. Fundi and Yusuf are very South African names. Uh, want to share three chocolate bars equally. And the question doesn't say how much does everybody get. The question says, can you show them how to do it? The follow-up question has three children, Jan, Sarah, and Ben, sharing four chocolate bars. And the question again is, can you show them how to do it? The question is not, how much will everybody get? So, and the third question says, four children share five bars of chocolate. How much will everybody get? The question again is not, how much, sorry, I got distracted there. The question is not, how much does everybody get? The question is, how can they do it? Here are some responses of children. There's a little girl called Varencia. And Varencia, in answering the first question, drew two children. A little girl and a little boy. Because in the story, there's a girl and a boy. And she drew the three bars of chocolate. And she gave everybody a bar of chocolate. <coughs> and then she took the last one and she cut it into pieces. And she concluded that each child got one and a half bars of chocolate. She's done much more than we asked her for. We asked her just to show us how to solve the problem, but she's actually given a name to that piece. And the name that she's given to the piece is correct. We are very excited. Just like we were excited about that boy who was doing two-digit addition, who got all of his answers correct. In the next problem, Varencia again draws three children. She draws four bars of chocolate. She gives one to each one and gives a piece to each child and concludes that everybody gets one and a half. And in the third problem, she gives four children. She gives them each a bar of chocolate and she concludes that each one gets one and a half. So on the one hand, we're excited because it's clear that she knows what to do. But on the other hand, we're not so happy because she's misnaming the pieces. So why is she misnaming the pieces? Hmm, I think I can explain that. Are you going to... Yeah, no, exactly. Can you give me a piece of... Can somebody give me a piece of this A4 paper? Yeah, there we are. Thanks, Sabrina. I no, no, thank you for trying. <laughs> No, this is why she says a half. Uh, 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 here's my claim. I mean, I'm, I'm accepting all these hypotheses, but her drawings don't suggest that. This is my hypothesis. On the day that she was introduced to fractions, her teacher walked into class and said, my children, what have I got here? And they said, a piece of paper. They said, my children, you are right. And today we are going to learn about fractions. They say after me, fractions. Fractions, 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 fractions. Good. Now watch carefully what teacher does. You must stop talking at the back there, otherwise you won't understand. Fractions are very difficult. <laughs> and then the teacher went like this. And my children, what have I got now? And the children said, two pieces of paper. And she said, no, my children, this is two half pieces of paper. Say after me, half, 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 half. And using the same spirit that says we first teach uh, multiplication by one digit and then by two digits and then by three digits, we've now introduced the children to their first fraction. And we don't teach them another fraction because we don't want to confuse them. And we practice the half for three to four long weeks. After three to four long weeks, it's time to introduce children to the next fraction. And we, the teacher walks into class, and she's not as well prepared as she was the last time, so she picks up one of these pieces of paper, and she says to the children, my children, what have I got here? And they say, a half piece of paper. And she says, no, 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 today this is a whole piece of paper. <laughs> and what I want you to watch me doing very carefully is boom and boom. And so what have I got here? This is a quarter, quarter. Say after me, quarter. And then the lesson goes quarter, half, half, quarter, 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 half, half. 
and the teacher holds them behind her back and she pulls them out one at a time and the children have to say if it's a quarter or a half. I, I know this doesn't happen in your classes. This happens in other people's classes. But what I've described is a very realistic introduction to fractions. And what is ironic about this, oh, by the way, and now we've introduced the children to two fractions, the half and the quarter, so we're not going to traumatize them any further. In grade three, we'll do the other fractions. But listen to the English language. Now, I don't know how it works in Arabic, but in the English language, if I divide a chocolate bar into eight pieces, they're called eighths. If I divide it into seven pieces, they're called sevenths. Eighth, seventh, sixth, fifth, fourth, threeth, and tooth. If the English language made sense, these would be called fourths, and these would be called tooth, which they, of course, they're not. But the only two fractions that she's been introduced to are the two fractions that don't obey the rules of the language. In other words, there's nothing in that name that conveys the meaning. Whereas if you introduce her to eighth and seventh and sixth and fifth right from the start, then this would just be an unusual name for this piece. What am I trying to illustrate again? I'm trying to illustrate that we have a choice in how we introduce things, but the way we teach things has a profound impact on what children learn. We cannot control what children take away from the situation. The only thing that we can control is to try to reduce the confusion in the situation so that the child doesn't take away too many misconstructions. By the way, Varencia is far smarter than I made her out to be. Because when you interview Varencia and you say, what happened in this problem over here? Sorry. Go back. And you say to Varencia, what happened in this problem over here? She says, there were three children. Good. And there were four bars of chocolate. And what did you do? I gave each one a bar of chocolate. And there was one left over. So I halved it into three pieces. Because what she took away from that lesson with the thing was that half is to cut. I halved it into three pieces. Now there may be other conjectures but I've done this more than a hundred times with many many children and they always say the same thing. I halved it into three pieces. I halved it into four pieces. Masi Kole is another child in the class and he does the same thing. He draws the children and he draws the chocolate bars and he gives everybody one and a piece. But I want to show you a girl called Shanae. Because what Sinead does is she takes that bar of chocolate and she divides it and she, uh, uh, sorry, she sh shares them and everybody gets one and a piece. And in the second problem, everybody again gets one and a piece. And in the third problem, everybody also gets one and a piece. But notice what has happened to the piece. Sinead, long before the learning about fractions, long before learning their names, long before, already knows that a half is bigger than a fourth. And a third is bigger than a fourth. Why? Because when you share a chocolate bar with lots of people, you get very little. When you share it with a few people, you get more. Shanae, who cannot even write fractions, already knows that a third is bigger than a fourth. And yet, when asked what is bigger, a fourth or a third, many, many grade six students will tell you that a fourth is bigger than a third because they're imposing their whole number scheme and again, they do that. Again, at the risk of getting this, let's do that. What am I trying to illustrate? I'm trying to illustrate that we had a choice. Either we went into class and say, today we're doing fractions, or we had a choice to say, here are some situations. Make sense of them. Now let's give a name to what you've done. <coughs> I'm going to take you, so that's we, that those were problems that we use in grade two. Here's a problem that we use in grade three, a few years later, uh, well, a year later. I want, to partic I want to focus on these two problems, and for just a moment, I want you to use a piece of paper in front of you and to think about how children might respond. Three children share five chocolate bars, and four children share six chocolate bars. Would you very quickly with your neighbor just try to imagine how children will respond to those two questions, please? Three children share five chocolate bars, and four children share six chocolate bars. I'm going to give you literally two minutes to think about that.
Let me see some of your... Yes, very good. Yes, good. Good, good. All right. If you haven't already, start working on the second problem. Start working on the second problem. That's 45 on the board. He, he told me till half past. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just go and make sure. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to cut in because there is some confusion about exactly what time the session ends. So, uh, in case I run out of time, which I don't want to do, this problem is very carefully designed and it always has the same outcome 30 okay good I thought so. okay all good in the first case the children will draw three children they will give each child a bar of chocolate and there are two left over this is the first time that there are two bars of chocolate left over until now there's always just been one bar of chocolate left over so they say oh I don't know what to do so what would you do if there was one left over? Well, if there was one left over, I would take that and I'd cut it into three pieces and I'd give everybody a piece. Very good. So now there's another one left over. Well, we could do the same thing and give everybody another piece. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I cut it into three halves, exactly. So everybody got one and two halves. No, no, let's, let's stop, stop going there. Everybody got one. Everybody got one and two thirds and in my work I try to encourage early grade teachers to write thirds for a very long time as opposed to writing two over three because two thirds conveys very much better what we're talking about than two over three does by the way just to get distracted for a moment what makes fractions so difficult is that if you're thinking about four seventh plus three fifths when you're thinking about that, it looks like numbers. But the number at the bottom is not a number. And this number is not a number. These are units. But because they look like numbers, it becomes confusing. What you're really doing is you're adding 4JD and $3. That's really what you're doing. You've got different denominations. And the problem with the different denominations is you can't add it. So either you've got to take your JD into dollars, or your dollars into JD, or your dollars and your JD into euros. That's really what this is. But because we present it from too early on as this, and because we use the language 4 over 7, 3 over 5, we add to the confusion. We've got to talk about 4 sevenths and 3 fifths. Sorry, back to my story. So, okay, just help you for a second. So back to the story of the fractions. Here we go. Shukran. So in the second problem, in the second problem, this is what happens. Some children will draw one, two, three, four children. They will give each one a bar. And they will have two left over. One, two. And in the same way that they did it over here, they will cut that into four pieces, and they will cut that into four pieces, and everybody will get one and two pieces. Everybody will get one and two-fourths. One and two-fourths. However, and I, we didn't have enough time, and I didn't walk around and see what you did, in every single class, there will be at least one, two, or three other children who do this. They will draw the four faces. They will give each one a bar of chocolate. One, two, three, four. And there will be two bars left over. 
and they will say, I'm going to let those two children share one bar and those two children share the other bar. In other words, dish, dish, everybody is going to get one and a half. One and one half. And what has just happened here? The problem situation has introduced the concept of equivalent fractions. The situation introduced the concept of equivalent fractions. We didn't have to have a lesson that said, and today we're going to learn about equivalent fractions. And by the way, we can have a very rich discussion in class that say, this is how Sabrine did it. Do we agree with her? Yes. Does it make sense? Yes. And this is how Iman did it. Does we agree with her? Yes. But they've got different answers. How is that possible in mathematics to have different answers? And my friends, there isn't a grade two or three child who doesn't say, when you put those two back together, you get this. They realize that's going on. They just haven't got the formal language with which to talk about it. So, continue with my story. Solving problems introduces different mathematics. We can use problems to introduce addition and subtraction, change, combine, and compare problems. We can use problems to introduce division, sharing, and grouping. We can use problems to introduce multiplication, boof, boof. We can use problems to introduce fractions, ratio, proportion, percentage, <laughs> differential calculus. All right? We have a choice. Either we teach a topic or we solve problems and reveal the mathematics through that. All right? But that's only the first purpose of problems. And by the way, I want to pause for a moment. Because people, when they hear me talk about this, get very frightened because they say, <gasps> you've got 20 children, 20 different methods. How do you deal with that? No, no, no. 20 children, only two solutions. Maybe there's a third one where some children didn't know what to do. But these are the only two solutions you get here. Why? Because this has been carefully structured. This has been inc incredibly carefully structured. I have done this problem, I have lost count of the number of classes. It is well over 100, 150 situations where I've done this with children. And children have never disappointed me. I've always got these two responses. What I'm trying to illustrate is that when I use the problems to introduce the mathematics, I'm much more in control than what I seem. I'm setting up a situation that is provoking the child to respond in a particular way and that response is the one I want. I've designed the problems very carefully to provoke a particular reaction. And I deliberately use the word provoke in the sense of, I know what you're going to do. I know provoke sometimes has a negative connotation. It's kind of nya, 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 until you hit me and then I say, oh, I got you to hit me. All right? Provoke in this sense has a positive connotation of, I managed to get you to respond in a particular way. By the way, it's just like raising a husband. <coughs> you know, it, it's, you know, the story that I tell very often, you know, I've been married for 25 very long, I mean, very happy years, and, and in our house, sometimes Monday's a little bit different to Tuesday, and Tuesday's a little bit nicer, and Wednesday there's a little bit of extra in my lunchbox, and, you know, so the week has a way of just being different. And on Friday evening, when Lynn and I are sitting in the kitchen having a reflection on the week, I look up and I notice and I say, you know, Linda, I think we need new curtains. Are we together? You see, if Linda had said to me on Monday, we need new curtains, I would have said, closed, open, closed, open, no light, light, no light, light. We don't need new curtains. These work perfectly well. But because of her very careful management of the situation, I, entirely by myself, said on Sun Friday night, I think we need new curtains. And at that point, her job was simply to say, I hadn't thought about that, but now that you mention it, yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> Are we together? This happens every day. We do the same with children. Set up the situation that they say, oh, there's a pattern here. And you say, oh my God, child, you are amazing. It only took you three weeks to see it, but you saw it. Thanks goodness for that. All right? The second purpose of problems is that they play an important part in helping children develop computational methods. What's that? 
it back to 11.45. Now I must dance for 10 more minutes. That's okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> they play an essential part in the development of computational strategies. I'm not gonna talk long about this, but I just wanna give you an illustration. This little boy was solving the problem, four children share 17 sweets. And he drew this picture over here. There were the four children and the 17 sweets, and he started allocating them one by one. You and I know this is going to become chaos. He can no longer solve the problem that way because the lines are going to intersect and he won't know what's going on. We left him for a few minutes and he, by himself, took that problem and he drew it, redrew it. He drew the four children and he went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. What am I trying to illustrate? I'm trying to illustrate that this strategy was perfectly good for 9 divided by 3. It was great, maybe even for 12 divided by 3, but 18, it was a disaster. So we deliberately asked him to share 18 so that he could come to the realization this doesn't work and look for a more efficient strategy. I'm not going to do so now, but in the work that we do on the RAMP project, we demonstrate how children move from the physical modeling to the sophisticated grade four way of division through a whole lot of intermediate steps. And those intermediate steps are provoked by the way we change the problem. So the second purpose of the problem, is the first purpose of the problem is to introduce children to mathematics. The second, by structuring the problems carefully, we help children to develop more efficient calculation strategies. More efficient age, grade, and number range appropriate calculation strategies. The final purpose of problems is that they make children's mathematical experiences personally significant and relevant. They experience mathematics as meaningful. They experience what we're doing as sensible. Many of you know the problem. There is a world famous problem in which in international research we ask children there are 13 sheep and uh, 16 goats on a ship how old is the captain and although you may have noticed this was a strange question to ask children will all give us an answer and by the way a well thought out answer because they say 16 minus 13 is too young for a captain 16 times 13 we don't multiply with such big numbers 16 divided by 13, it doesn't go. So it has to be 16 plus 13, and the captain is 26. 84% of respondents give 26 as the answer to that question. I may have got the numbers wrong, but the spirit of it is right. Because they have long ago suspended any attempt at sense making, because mathematics over here does not relate to mathematics over here. Mathematics over here is about finding numbers and doing things. So, thank you for your patience and thank you for your interest in listening to me. I hope there's been some value in it. Uh, we have about 10 minutes in which we can have some discussion and, and answer some questions, but I want to conclude with two key slides. The first is that children who are taught mathematics as rules and procedures very soon for stop making sense. And that is why in the second part of my professional career, my interest is so much more in the early grades. Because if we can fix the foundational understanding, then the rest is easier. I can't speak for Jordan, although I've been working here for six years, but I can speak for South Africa when I can say unequivocally that for the majority of children, their mathematics careers end in grade four. Why? Because in grade one, two, and three, you can get away with remembering many answers you can remember enough answers to pass. When you get to grade four, five, six, if you don't understand, you can no longer pass, and then you start failing. And when children start failing mathematics, they give up on mathematics. The second comment is that we need to make this shift. Now I'm gonna make, I'm gonna spend one more minute on this. Many years ago, when there were no calculators, the only way that we could calculate with large numbers was to learn procedures for calculating with large numbers. When I was at school, there were no calculators. I, my, school of, my, my mathematics experience with school was learning to calculate with large numbers. And even there, those of you who are old enough to remember, 
to be honest, we didn't actually calculate with large numbers. Because when the large numbers became very large, we used logarithms. Multiplying very large numbers involved converting the number to a log, adding the logs, finding the anti-log, which gave you a very good approximation of the answer. So even there, we had a calculator. It was paper-based. I know some of you don't understand that. Some of you don't understand a world without a cell phone. It's, it's anyway, back, back, back to my story. Okay, so in this world, we had to learn how to calculate. That world is gone. The world has changed. We live in a world where calculations are done automatically. So we can take the resources at school and now shift them away from two cents making. I don't want to be misunderstood because it's very easy to be misunderstood. I did not say children don't have to calculate. I didn't say that. I just said they didn't have to learn algorithms for calculating with very large numbers. Because for that there is a calculator. They must learn to calculate in a reasonable number domain. But because we don't have to teach them to calculate with large numbers, we've got a lot of space left in which to focus on sense making, meaning making, and problem solving as a meaningful experience. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. We have time for comments and questions. Yes, sir. One more time. Uh, I'm not sure how that works. I, I'm very happy for it to be posted on the website. Yeah. If not, there's my email address. Drop me an email, and I'm very happy to send it to you. That's, that's not a problem. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, from your experience, one of the main obstacles in primary stage is the long division. Mm -hmm. So, from your experience as a trainer, could you suggest how, how can such concept be taught for students, especially for those who don't? have enough knowledge about the time Okay, so there's two things. One, the multiplication table is important. But how we learn it is the issue. The second issue is the long division algorithm. And without being disrespectful, I'm going to make a statement that may not be popular. But the statement is that the long division algorithm is no longer the supreme achievement of primary school mathematics. <coughs> Children don't have to learn the long division algorithm because w many primary school teachers tell me, but when they go to high school, my friends, when they go to high school, they will never divide using the long division algorithm again because there is no utility for it. There is a calculator. The second thing is teachers will say, but when they come to algebraic fractions, when they come to algebraic fractions, let them deal with it then. Okay? But so, as I say, it may be an unpopular response, but my response is, they don't have to learn the long division algorithms. There are sense making. With all respect, sure. For all what you are saying, this is not the case in the schools. The schools are they have totally different fields. They insist on learning long division algorithms. A skill, it's a skill that's needed later for other skills. Okay. So how can they build on? Okay. The lack of long division. Children don't come to school wanting to learn the long division algorithm. It may be that their parents may remember being at school and remember the long division algorithm, therefore want their children to learn it. That's about parent education. It's also about curriculum change. The curriculum still has the long division algorithm. That is time to go. So what I'm saying is a lot of that is more around, um, it's, it's more around reconceptualizing what it means to do mathematics. But I want to come back to the multiplication tables because I spend a lot of time traveling and I meet a lot of people and in particular I meet a lot of parents and parents often say to me, you know Arnold, the problem with school today is that children don't know their multiplication tables. When we were at school, we knew our multiplication tables. And then I have to be very sensitive and delicate and not finish the sentence for them and you still failed mathematics. <laughs> but leave that aside. The parents' memorization or memory of school mathematics is that you had to go 1 times 2 is equal to 2, 2 times 2 is equal to 4, 3 times 2 is equal to 6, 4 times 2 is equal to 8. You had to learn to sing the song. Now the problem is we can learn to sing songs without knowing the meanings of the words. I don't know how it is in your country, but in my country when you graduate from school, from university, they have this song, Guardiamus Igatur, it's the traditional pomp and circumstance 
song. It's, a, it's in Latin. We stand in graduations and we sing that great passion and emotion is evoked. I haven't got a clue what we're saying. Not a clue. All right? But you can go 1 times 2 is equal to 2, 2 times 2 is equal to 4, 3 times, in that trance-like state. There is an easier way to learn the multiplication tables. And I don't have the slides readily handy, but, but we use them in the RAMP project. Um, in the traditional approach to teaching multiplication tables, we begin with a 2 times table, then the 3 times table, and then the 4 times table, because 2 is smaller than 3, which is smaller than 4, so it must be easier. Yeah. The first multiplication table you should learn is the 10 times table. Because the 10 times table has got a very easy pattern to it. 3 times 10, 4 times 10, 8 times 10, 6 times 10. I'm going around the class asking the children, by the time I get to here, 9 times 10, 8 times 10, 7 times 10, somebody over there is whispering, he's just putting a zero on the end. He's just putting a zero on What did you say? Just putting a zero on the end. If that is the case, what's 18 times 10? What's 23 times 10? What's 54 times 10? Because suddenly when you see that pattern, you've been liberated. And you no longer, ha there's a pattern, there's a structure. And you can multiply any number by 10. Now, of course, to say he's putting a zero on the end is mathematically not sound. But that doesn't matter. It describes what the child is seeing. We can fix the sounds of it later. And here's the big thing. When you can multiply by 10, you can multiply by 5. Give me any two-digit number. 26. 26 times 5 is 130. Because 26 times 10 is 260, and half of that is 130. Clearly, they didn't have a lot of faith in me. They used a small number. So give me a bigger two-digit number. 73. That's a tough one, but we can do it. 73 times 5 is 730. Half of that is 350 plus 15, 365. 73 times 5 is 365. You could take out your cell phone. You can't keep up with me. I can do this faster. All right? I go to, I'm coming to you now. I go to grade 4 classes and I say to the children, oh, you're so good at multiplication. Your teacher tells me you're very good. They say, yes, we're very good. I said, good. 23 times 15. They say, no, no, no. We only go up to 12. But 23 times 15 is 23 times 10, 230. Half of that's 135. Put it back together, 345. So, and I can carry on like this. I can play this game for a while and show off incredibly. But the point is, the serious point is, we do want children to know their multiplication tables. But how? And it's not 1 times 2 is equal to 2, 2 times 2 is equal to... We want them to know it in this structured, pattern-like way and by the way, there's, I am coming to you, there's one more important comment about this. I can only do what I'm doing in showing off because I practice it. And that's the important part of the school. In other words, it's not a question of today you saw the pattern put a zero on the end. Unless you use that regularly, unless you practice that deliberately, you're not going to be able to use that a lot. <coughs> to finish off that story, Multiplying by 2, 4, and 8 is exactly the same thing. Because it's doubling, doubling, and doubling again. Give me a two-digit number. 56. Let's multiply 56 by 8. 56 doubled is 112. Doubled again is 224. Doubled again is 448. 56 times 8 is 448. All right? Once you see these patterns, you can use them. And that's what we need to do. Is we need to help children to see the structure so that they can make sense of it and apply it. And by the way, if you can multiply by 10, 5, 2, 4, and 8, you've pretty much got all you need. And then you can use it to do division, because once you understand multiplication, it's related to division. Your question. Yes.
such topic, uh, such uh, context, such examples, in the sense of numbers, uh, what, what other the available resources. Yeah. Okay. I, I, th I thank you very much for that comment. I think it's very, very helpful because what I think it does is two things. It highlights the fact that the curriculum doesn't always help us because it is in a particular paradigm. And one of the things that we have to have courage about is seeing how to revise that. One. The second point you made, and it's a very good point, is that teachers are very busy. Teachers have got an enormous amount of work to do. And to design a problem that does this takes time. Then you have to go and re uh, pilot it with children, see if they respond the way you expect them to respond. This takes time. Which brings me to my second, my second response to you is that I really think that what we have to do is we have to work hard as governments, as whatever, to develop excellent materials and support teachers to implement those. I don't think we must ask teachers to be materials developers because I think that is a bridge too far. In the work that I do, I'm certainly involved in materials development. In the work that we've done on the RAMP project with the colleagues from the QRTA, we've supported teachers by developing three or 400 worksheets that take this and convey it. In the work that I do in South Africa, we've developed mathematics programs that schools adopt. We have a different system to your country where we don't have a national textbook, but that's how we do it. So it is around that. But there's a third element to it. And that is once you've developed the effect of materials, you then need to support teachers to use those materials in the way that they were intended. Because, take the fraction example. It appeared in the book without a heading, without anything that said equivalent fractions. It was just an innocent problem. If the teacher didn't realize that the purpose of the problem was to get two responses, and then to have a discussion about those two responses, then the opportunity was wasted. So teacher training, so, so my answer is excellent materials with appropriate teacher training on how to make a success of those materials. And to take it one further, because I've been involved in doing this for a long time now, use the materials to help teachers develop a deeper understanding of mathematics. So instead of teaching them more or different mathematics, just work through the materials. And they will reach a point where they say, I'm starting to understand this in a different way. It takes time. It's a bit naive, but it takes time. Any other comments? We don't have to. Yes. Don't be shy. But if we can go back to the picture where the board, the board, the chalkboard child is yes. confused and drawing a lot of lines at the end of the 18. Yes, no, I know exactly which one you asked for. I've just messed up. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so to be clear, this child is not confused. This child is doing something and he realizes that it's going to be difficult to get the answer out of this because the drawing is becoming too messy. And so he goes for a more efficient drawing. Now, I can show you, the time doesn't allow, but I've got, I've got some other slides where we have situations where the children can do what he did and get a different answer to their peers. Then we have a discussion, why? And then we say, right, let's model it physically, let's whatever. So part of getting from that to this is by realizing that that isn't working so well anymore. It used to work when the numbers were small, but it's not working now. So now we need. But what the teacher's role in class and what the parent's role, but what the teacher's role in class is to say, you're getting stuck, you're getting stuck, but she's managing. Won't you show them what you've done? And in that way to, because she, that's what she wants, you see. The tension is not to tell. Why? Because the minute you tell, the child thinks, ah, that's what the teacher wants me to do. So I'm going to do that. And then they start to do it without understanding. But if I say, can you show her what you've done? I'm actually telling her what to do. But I'm doing it in a s very subtly different way. Teachers have an incredible authority in class. I'm going to make a strange statement now. 
Children come to school trying to make their teachers happy. That is a strange statement because if you're a school teacher, there are many days on which you find that hard to believe. But children come to school trying to make you happy. So they look for clues of what you want. And that's why you've got to be so careful about doing too much telling because then they do it without understanding. Whereas what I did, I d what I demonstrated here was telling without telling. It's my story about the new curtains. All right? We got new curtains. Linda told me that we needed new curtains. She just did it in such a careful way that I actually thought I, it was my good idea. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your patience. I hope there was some value. Have a good day.